Anxiety and depression are more prevalent than you might think. According to the CDC, from August 2020 to February 2021 alone, the prevalence of adults experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorders grew by 5%. In this podcast, our guest is Barris Burgoyne, a naturopath and medical herbalist. Barris draws from her years of clinical experience to tell us about how patients present with anxiety and depression, causes and contributing factors, chronic stress and changes in the brain, and several medicinal herbs she uses to support patients with anxiety and depression. Well, as we thought about this year and the last few years, a lot of people have been um, thinking about anxiety and depression and how that affects um, our world. And so our topic today is really poignant. Ferris Bagoin is with us again to bring us a wealth of knowledge in herbal medicine and how that can affect many, many areas. And today we're going to focus on the area of depression and anxiety. So Barris, how common do you think it really is that depression and anxiety is in the United States? Thank you. Yes, look, I, I believe that it's probably in all over the world really is a little bit higher incidence than what many of us would like to think really. Uh, and that's certainly increased in the last couple of years when we've seen a lot of changes. If we look at data from the CDC, during the period of August 2020 to February 21, the, the actual percentage of uh, US adults that had recent symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorders increased from 36.5% to about 41.5%. So, you know, there's been a big increase, but even at 36.5%, which was considered to be you know, prior to the last couple of years, that percentage is still very high, but it's certainly increased in recent times for obvious reasons. The largest increase in this time has actually been in the 18 to 29 year age group. And I guess that's not surprising because this is the age group that has a higher incidence of depression anyway. Another thing that we know about depression is that the incidence is more common in women. And that's when we're looking at adolescents and adults. So right across from 18 year or probably from uh, 12 years of age onwards, we see uh, that age group is the highest. It's actually women who are more often diagnosed with these conditions and certainly more so than men. And this is when we're looking at adolescents and adults. So right from 12 years, right throughout life, at any age group that you look at, it will be women that have the higher incidence. But of course, we can't exclude children from this discussion because we know that children can often have emotional disruption. And if we look at the CDC estimates going back to 2017, that's the latest I could find, they estimated then that one in six children aged between two and eight years had a mental, behavioural or developmental disorder. That, that is quite astounding, I think. And I believe those numbers would have increased too in the last couple of years. So the incidence is quite high. And even though when we see patients in our clinic, they may not come in with depression or anxiety. There might be a whole range of things that they're coming to us for. But quite often in our patients, it won't take us long to pick up that there is a degree of either depression or anxiety perhaps going on. And when you ask them about it, they'll readily identify with it. Now, I'm not saying here that we do like um, is done sometimes in the medical profession, particularly with women, when they present with any number of different complaints, uh, they can be readily told that they have depression. And I'm not advocating that at all. We need to investigate thoroughly. Uh, mainly with case history with our patients, but depression is more common than what we would think in the patients that we see in our clinics. You know, that's really interesting that, you know, women, but, and especially, you know, kind of that younger age group, we see that often in college campuses and other places. As we think about anxiety and depression, can you kind of um, define them a little bit more for us? 
and then really help us understand, you know, what are what are considered in those types of disorders? What what would that that patient look like? Well, I think probably the first thing as a practitioner to remember is that they they complex conditions, and as such, they, there's no one one cause of these conditions. So, and I'll talk more about. The, the possible sort of underlying pathophysiology shortly. But what we do often see with both of these conditions is that they can overlap. So it's considered that patients with depression will often, about 50% of them, will often have a degree of anxiety that, that comes along with the depression. And when these two conditions do coexist in a patient, there's usually one that dominates so it might be depression that, that is a main uh, symptom that the patient's feeling, and that can be accompanied by, by a degree of anxiety, or we might have a patient who really feels very anxious, and along with that can come some depression. So we need to consider this in our treatment, but most often in my clinical experience, one of these will predominate. And we don't see this co-occurrence in all patients presenting with these conditions, but it will happen in many of them. Now, I said before, there's no one cause of these conditions. So as clinicians, you know, our main way to try and sort out what's going on with the patient is to take a really thorough case history and really listen to what the patient's saying. And when I say listen to them, we obviously have to listen to what they're telling us verbally, but I think also we really need to observe the non-verbal cues that we're getting from that patient because these will often give us a lot of information that the patient isn't giving us verbally. And then we can ask more deeply about things that we think we might be seeing there. And, and I think this is a really important part of clinical practice. And, you know, Kerry Bone once talked about uh, when he was putting together the functional herbal therapy that, you know, the patient's story is the most important information that we have. And that's something that we really, we can sometimes get bogged down in research as practitioners, and that's important, but we need to always come back to the patient and what's happening with each individual patient. Great. As we think about, you know, we can't focus on that one single condition. We need to really focus on the holistic patient, right? So yes, how can we then, you know, kind of focus more about what are some of those contributing factors or causes that may have the patients have these types of concerns in their life? If we look at the research on depression, I'll talk about depression because there's probably a little bit more research on that. There's been quite a few hypotheses put forward over the years as to why somebody might be depressed. We have the monoamine hypothesis, and that simply means that, you know, the monoamines are not in balance or there might be a deficiency of one monoamine. And the one we hear most about, of course, is, is serotonin. There's neuroendocrine mechanisms, and that's really where the, the you know, HPA axis really isn't working well. The neuroimmune cytokine hypothesis, which simply means there's inflammation, and we know there's inflammation with these conditions. And more recently, there's been the uh, neuroplasticity hypothesis put forward, where there's an issue with neuroplasticity. And what can often happen in the scientific and medical world is that when a new hypothesis emerges, the others can be somewhat forgotten and everybody focuses on this. This is what's happening in, in patients with depression. And we have to be very careful of that as practitioners. I believe that patients we see with these conditions will probably have maybe all of these things going on or at least some of them. It's very unlikely they're going to have, have just one. And the reason we have so many hypotheses is that, you know, this ongoing research into these conditions, which is a great thing, but we need to remember that there's not just going to be one of these happening in each patient. And if we bring it back to, you know, day to day in our clinics and what we need to think about and do with these patients is let's just remember that stress is the major contributor to depression and anxiety. And many of our patients are stressed and many of them will be suffering from chronic stress. 
And this doesn't only contribute to depression and anxiety, it also contributes and plays a role in all those different hypotheses that I've just mentioned. So if your patient's stressed, particularly with chronic stress, then we have to be dealing with that. That's, that's often the starting point. And we do that by improving the stress response and improving the functioning of the HPA axis. As we think about stress and HPA access and how that all interacts and how, you know, that also then creates this inflammatory response and all these different, you know, kind of like physiological effects, right? And so yes, absolutely. when we think about depression or, you know, stress in general, that it's not only the way we feel emotionally, it is a physiological aspect too. And so maybe we, we could talk just a little bit more about chronic stress and how that has an alteration in the brain and in the CNS. Sure, absolutely. If we're seeing stress patients, and we'd all be aware of this, we experience it ourselves from time to time. Uh, if you know, if patients are stressed, particularly with chronic stress, they'll probably have sleep disruption, circadian rhythm disruption. We might see them complaining about, oh, I just can't concentrate so well, they've got disturbance in cognition, memory, learning, etc. And, you know, they we can also see in these people uh, sometimes disruption in rational thinking and emotions and changes in behaviour. And this is particularly the case if the chronic stress has been going on for a long time. And, you know, in my life, it's not only patients I see this in sometimes, I see it in people close to me where they, they just start behaving in a much uh, more irrational type of way due to chronic stress. And if we look at this from a pathophysiological point of view, uh, you know, what do we see? What's happening there? Well, we know that one of the things that happens with chronic stress is that we have suppression of neuronal proliferation and synaptic plasticity. And when we're talking about synaptic plasticity, we know that people who have suicidal thoughts actually have reduced synaptic plasticity. So there's a real link there between what's going on with the neurons and what we're feeling, and that, that's fairly obvious. We also know that in people who are chronically stressed, we see changes in different areas of the brain. We'll see a weakening of the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. And we can see an overactivity of another part of the brain called the amygdala. So just to sort of uh, put this into context, what does all this mean? I'll just spend a little bit of time going through these three different areas of the brain and what they're responsible for. And when you know what they do, then you can realize what's going to be happening so first of all, if we look at the prefrontal cortex, it regulates our emotions, our morality, our intuition. It modulates our feelings of fear. So you can imagine if the prefrontal cortex is not working in the way that it should, then we're not going to be able to regulate our emotions. We're not going to be able to modulate our feelings of fear. We're probably going to be much more fearful and sometimes irrationally so. It also allows us to have empathy and insight. And one of the things that it does, it actually helps us to have good thought through rational decisions. So it actually helps us to, to think before we act. So all of those things are very important. So if it's not working properly, you might have people making knee-jerk decisions and having knee-jerk reactions to situations that may be way out of context to, uh, you know, what, what we're looking at. Now, the hippocampus is associated with memory, learning and mood regulation. So it's no wonder if that's not working properly, people have trouble with, with just their cognition and just getting their brain to work properly. And then we come to another part of the brain called the amygdala. And we can think of the amygdala as the guard dog. And I've actually heard it called the, the panic button centre of the brain. And what the amygdala is there for, one of its prime functions, is to protect us when we're in dangerous situations. It actually helps us respond very quickly 
to threatening situations. So we have the fight or flight response or maybe the freeze response. And it's really meant to keep us safe. And it does that very well when we're in dangerous situations. But the amygdala can't distinguish between the stress of running late for work or a patient who's chronically stressed just with normal day-to-day -day stressors can't distinguish that from being in a dangerous, life-threatening situation. So all of the same things happen in the amygdala, no matter what the stress. So we're not going to behave in a rational, logical way if our amygdala is overactive because we're going to be reacting as if we're in a life-threatening situation. So we can often see really aggressive behaviour, those knee-jerk reactions and decisions. And our lives can become really chaotic because we're not making good decisions. But apart from that, we're not going to be able to uh, learn well. So if you're a student who's chronically stressed, and we see this particularly in students at high school and at college, they can be very stressed. Their ability to learn and remember things is really diminished here. It might come down to we just don't remember normal day-to-day -day things like we forget important appointments or we don't remember where we put our wallet or car keys. And all of these things just add to the chaos of our lives and make the stress much worse. And, you know, I think probably many of us have, have gone through situations like this in our lives. So what I tell my patients when I'm talking to them about this is don't despair, all is not lost. We can change the response of the amygdala. We can improve the function of the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. And there's lifestyle things that we can do. And one of the most important is exercise. It's really important to exercise. Nutrition's also really important. And we know that a high sugar, uh, low nutrient diet exacerbates this problem. And what sort of foods do many of us turn to when we're chronically stressed? We turn to comfort foods, and these are often high in sugar and low in nutrition and highly processed. Adequate sleep is essential. If we're not getting enough sleep, then none of the brain regions can work in the way that they should, and we're going to be more stressed. And other things that are important but not always thought about are things like having meaningful relationships, socialising, having a variety of life experiences. So there's, you know, a lot that we can do in our day-to-day -day lives to improve this situation. And as practitioners, we have a number of nutritional and herbal supplements that are very beneficial in reducing the adverse effects of stress and in managing our patients that we see with depression and anxiety. And if they can take these supplements along with doing the lifestyle modifications, we can see really good results in our patients. You know, I think, you know, we've all had that situation where our lives have been stressful for a variety of reasons, right? And then it has an effect on kind of, you know, our functionality, how we, you know, um, manage everyday activities and it becomes much more difficult as you um, said. I know when I've had those kind of situations like yoga can be so beneficial, you know, um, and that helps you clear your mind and then helps you sleep and how all that is interconnected. I think it's just so important to realize when we're talking to our patients. You know, we started yes, to sort absolutely. of bring forward this idea of, you know, herbs and the way herbs can support those patients. In addition, you know, they need to have those strong lifestyle changes and nutrition changes. But what are what are some of the herbs that you would recommend um, to your patients? I think that when we're dealing with these patients, we need to think about how can we manage the effects or reduce the detrimental effects of chronic stress. And, you know, we're really fortunate. We've got a whole range of, of herbs that can do this. And I think the most important ones, the starting point when we're treating patients, are a group of herbs called adaptogens. And adaptogens, they're called adaptogens because they help us adapt physiologically and emotionally to stress. And they also help preserve energy when we're really stressed, particularly chronically stressed, 
how energy is diminished and the adaptogens can help with that as well. So the, the key adaptogens that I love to use in my clinic, and I use these, you know, probably with, with most patients that come into my clinic would get an adaptogen. So eleuthero, ashwagandha, Korean ginseng, rhodiola, schizandra, and astragalus. These are the key ones that I use in my clinic. And this group of herbs are probably among the, the most used herbs in my clinic. And we also can use the adrenal tonics because, of course, the adrenals are the end of the HPA axis. And the adrenal tonics, licorice and Romania, actually help to restore and preserve the health and function of the adrenal cortex. Whether the, the stress is just acute and maybe short-lived or whether it's more long-term or chronic. And I think these are really the starting point when we're dealing with patients suffering from any kind of emotional upheaval, really. But we can combine with these herbs some other herbs that are very specific for maybe either depression or anxiety. So if we look at a couple of herbs that are quite specific for depression, St. John's wort is absolutely the key antidepressant herb that we have. And, you know, there's a lot of gold standard clinical research showing that it's very effective for mild to moderate depression. And it also has some anti-anxiety uh, activity as well. So it's fabulous for those patients that are experiencing both when the predominant symptom is depression. Now, one thing that I do want to mention when, I talking, when I'm talking about St. John's wort is that it can interact with a number of pharmaceutical medications, both over-the-counter and prescribed. Now, don't be fearful of using this herb in your depressed patient because of these uh, possible interactions, but just be aware of them. And I always just refer to a very good, reliable herb drug interaction chart that's available to practitioners to determine if St. John's wort is safe to use in a particular patient that might be taking pharmaceuticals. Another herb that I absolutely love to use with, in depression is saffron. And I often use these two herbs in combination with maybe some other herbs in there as well. And if we look at how these herbs work, I'm sure we don't know uh, everything there is to know about them. But one of the mechanisms by which they work is to improve the levels of uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. And we know that chronic stress decreases levels of BDNF. And if you've got reduced levels, it makes you more vulnerable to the effects of stress and depression. It also helps to actually regulate and um, monitor synaptic plasticity. And low levels are, due, uh, are associated with reduced plasticity. So it's a very important uh, neurotropic factor, and we can enhance that with these herbs. And I always combine these herbs with the adaptogens and adrenal tonics. Now, when it comes to anxiety, I think the key herb, and certainly my favourite herb, would be carb. It has very significant anxiolytic activity, and it's been demonstrated in a number of clinical trials for fairly severe anxiety disorders and was very efficacious without significant side effects. And it also is a great hypnotic herb, so it helps with sleep disorders as well. So it's a good all-round herb for the patient with anxiety. Again, I combine it with adaptogens and adrenal tonics. And there's a couple of other nervous system herbs that I love to use in my patients, and these are skullcap and passionflower. And so often I'll have a combination of herbs in a formulation, either a tablet or a liquid, depending on the patient. But I think we can really be confident that we have fantastic herbal supplements that can help these patients, particularly if they can adopt lifestyle changes and dietary changes and recommendations that we give them. I think, you know, all those things are just a great way to and have an additional improvement on your patient's health, you know, and making sure that you're thinking about the patient and all those needs is really key. 
So as we come to a close, what other things would you want to tell our audience today that could help them with their patient with anxiety and depression? I think it's worth remembering when we see patients experiencing these conditions that probably most of us will experience depression and anxiety probably sometime during our lifetimes. And often these emotions are in response to life events or life experiences, and they can be short-lived and they, they, they often resolve in a timely fashion and don't become serious conditions. And I really love what I learned from a teacher of traditional Chinese medicine once. And she said that in traditional Chinese medicine, no emotions are good or bad. They come and they go, and we're meant to experience them all. But the problem happens when we get stuck for one reason or another in any of these emotions. And when this happens, and when we're seeing patients who are stuck in depression or anxiety, and sometimes because of ongoing life situations, I believe we can be really confident as practitioners that we have a whole plethora of tools to offer these patients. We can offer them lifestyle uh, information and dietary information. We can give them nutritional supplements. And we certainly have a whole range of wonderful efficacious herbal supplements to add in there as well. And I think the combination of all of these things and based on my clinical experience, I can honestly say that if we can do all of this with our patients and really listen to what they're telling us, then we can bring about profound changes in these patients and in their quality of life. Thank you so much, Ferris. This was such a enlightening conversation and such um, you know important at this time in the world um, to have these kind of discussions to help our patients. Um, you know, improve their overall well-being. So thank you again. Thank you for listening to the Medicinal Herbs podcast from Holistic Matters. To learn more about stress, anxiety, and depression, as well as more information on every single herb mentioned in this episode, visit holisticmatters.com. That's holistic with a W.